All right. How we doing? Good. Hey, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians today. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn over uh, to 1 Corinthians. Uh, before we begin, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the word of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to those who are being saved. Now, how many of you know that things aren't always what they appear to be? Right? How many of y'all watched the Alabama game last night? <laughs> yeah, they're rolling all right in Alabama. I mean, that game, didn't, you had number one. I'm a South Carolina fan. We love when Vanderbilt's on the schedule, right? It's kind of a give-me game. Well, it used to be. Um, so it didn't appear, and even when I turned the TV on, that was not the game that I can't wait to watch the Alabama-Vanderbilt game because it's going to be an amazing football game. The powerhouses of these two schools, you have one that has billions of dollars in cash and the other one who you got to have a super high SAT score and IQ to even get into and then that limits your football team, right? No offense to football players. But when you turn it on and realize there's three minutes to go and Vanderbilt somehow is up by five points over this powerhouse, it's like, Surely ESPN has got this thing typed in wrong. You know what I mean? And then you find out, uh, Vanderbilt wins, and they take down Alabama. So if you're an Alabama fan today, um, it's about time. It's about time is all I'm going to say. You deserve it, every bit of it, um, and we don't care. So, <laughs> but bad thing is South Carolina has you guys next weekend, so it's going to be really bad for us. <laughs> But sometimes things just aren't what they appear. I hate when people say, hey, I got something I want to give you for free. Right. What's the cost? Hey, I'd like to talk to you about getting free solar panels. Oh, what's this going to cost? I don't know, 30 years of payments and some holes in your roof, right? <laughs> Everything is, is what it appears, even with all the devastation that has been going on in Asheville. The reports that we get from the grounds from people versus what we get from the media is not what it appears to be. Now, we got one group that told me that they went and they were told to bring flat beds and latex gloves to help remove bodies. But then the news says the waters are seeding and everything is going great. And we're doing all these things. Sometimes things aren't what they appear. By the way, let me give you a quick update. We've partnered with Trailside Church in uh, Traveler's Rest, South Carolina, and we've been able to, um, we just had you link, link directly with them. We've been giving money uh, to their site. They filled a truck yesterday, a semi-truck full of supplies. Like this was all a dream. Their church is the same size that we are. It was a prayer that they wanted to do something. We got people behind it. And yesterday, a semi-truck left that parking lot, headed towards Asheville, completely full of supplies because of your giving. And it has put uh, much needed resources into the hands of the people that needed it, not just some big organization. So thank you all uh, for giving. Uh, that. Yep, you can clap. But the Asheville area, and we have some people that, that have strong ties with that area. It's, it's, it's a, an area where churches are trying to break through the spiritual darkness of that place. And, and the ones on the ground in Asheville is the church. It is shining. And it's church people who are hiking up these mountains and followers of Jesus who are trying to give out supplies and ministering and praying. There's a spiritual darkness over that place that we want to pray. I thought it was interesting when they said they want to do prayer cards of specific prayers from people in that area. And, you know, we always do it on a Christmas tree uh, during Christmas where we put gifts. And the only tree we had was the olive tree. And um, I know that may have sounded weird when they said the prayers will be on the olive tree. But anybody know what the olive tree represents? Israel, but peace. You know, the olive, I'm going to give you the olive branch. And so as you take cards and we pray over them, just remember that, that we're praying peace and for the light of God because darkness will not prevail. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It will not prevail because Jesus is light. So things aren't always what they appear to be. And the cross is one of those things. The Romans had this cross to crucify people who wouldn't come into an alignment or buy into the ideologies of the Roman government. So what they would say was, we're just going to crucify you. You break the law, you're going to die execution. They enjoyed it. It was a game. This is why when Jesus is being crucified, they're down there casting lots for the garments. It's just one big joke uh, to them. And, and so when you look at the cross from a Roman perspective, man, this thing means death. It means punishment. 
Uh, but when the cross, when we look at it, what appears to be death, on this side of fo- being a follower of Jesus, the cross for us is not about defeat, it's about victory, right? It's not what it appears to be. A lot of people look at the cross as a symbol, and it's a symbol of defeat for many, but for us as believers, that is a symbol of victory. It may appear that the cross might be something that is the end, but we as believers know the cross is not the end. It is just the beginning because there was a resurrection, baby. You know what I'm talking about? There was a resurrection, and so we understand that when we look at the cross for many, it's not what it appears to be. It is more than just two pieces of wood that have been slapped together for the punishment of people. It was the bridge that God built in order to get us back into relationship with him. Amen? So I want to speak to you about that today. I want to speak to you about the cross and the power and the wisdom of God. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 21, it says, For the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom. So we got two groups here. Who are they? Jews and the Greeks, okay? So the Jews ask for signs where the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God because God's foolishness, I love this verse, God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Let me help you understand today how people respond to the message of the cross when they hear it. When you share the gospel, when you talk about church, when you talk about anything religious, I want to give you, uh, and and see if this resonates, because remember this has been written a long time ago, but see if this resonates with you as we go through this message today about how even our culture, how they accept or reject the gospel. But let me give you some context. Paul's writing this letter to the church of Corinth. He spent about a year and a half there. He leaves, he goes to Ephesus. While he's there, he's like, you know what, I probably need to send them a letter. So we just got a letter. And they open it, they're excited. Paul sent us a letter. Can't wait to read the letter that Paul sent. This is going to be amazing. We're going to share it. He's going to point out all the great things that we've done as a church together. So they gather the people and like, hey, we got a letter from Paul. Y'all ready? You want to read the letter? Uh Uh-oh. Sitting the same one they got in Philippi. Because the letter in Philippi was, you guys are doing fantastic. You, you love each other. You care for each other. Keep pushing on. But Corinth, it was like, let me just summarize. Stop doing dumb stuff. Stop being dumb. Because what was happening in Corinth, as Paul's writing this, there was a division that was taking place. And so what he's wanting to do is write this to address the issues that's happening within the church. And so he's, he's specifically trying to address the division. Corinth was in a, a, a hub for the Romans where people would come in and out. And a lot, when, when there's a hub and people come from all over the world in that place, they tend to leave their beliefs in that place. And so what was happening was, hey, let's read some philosophy. Let's understand this. And so our wisdom, we got our God stuff here, but let's, let's add some things to it. How many of you know when you add to God, uh, that's not a good thing? Like you, you get in a false, false thing. And so Paul is addressing and he is writing about these divisions. And, and let me tell you something. If Corinth got a letter from Paul, I can guarantee you right now, the day the American church would also get a letter from Paul. And Paul says this. I'm, I'm just going to go back real quick in the, in the chapter 1, He's, just to give you some background. He says, hey, I'm appealing to you, my brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that all of you agree. We need to be in agreement that there will be no divisions among you. But you are to be united. You ready? You need to be united in the same mind. How do we do that? We get around the same scripture. We study scripture together in the same judgment. It's been reported to me. Somebody somebody snitched. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's some, some arguing among my brothers. And what I mean is that each of you said, well, I follow Paul. Paul's my guy. I follow Paul. Paul's the good guy. And others say, I follow Apollos. And some say that you follow Cephas. Some say, I follow Christ. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Anybody want to answer that question? No. Now remember, this is being read to the church in Corinth. And he's, he's exposed. And some people are getting a little upset. Because, well, I, I follow Apollos. And he says, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Were you crucified in the name of Paul? He said, I thank God that I baptized none of you. Did you hear that? I, that's, I'm, that's a crazy thing from a pastor. I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you. Except for Crispus and Gaius. 
so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did, not, I, I did baptize also in the household of some others. He says, beyond that, I don't, I don't know whether I baptized anybody else. I have no idea who I baptized. He says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but sent me to preach the gospel, and not with words of this eloquent wisdom. He says, but let the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, Paul's a genius. I mean, he is smart. If you read his writings in the original context, Paul trained with the best of the best and could come up here and talk circles around us and throw out vocabulary that we would have to Google the whole time and couldn't even pronounce. And he could have shown off and could have showed that his degree and how beautiful his degree was. But Paul said, it wasn't about the things that I've learned in the classroom. It was about the things I learned from my time with Jesus. And when Paul talks about us learning and understanding, it wasn't by us just reading. It was by experience. How many of you learn more when you have an experience, you learn more about that through the experience than you did through the reading, right? I was working at a summer camp my dad ran once, and uh, we had this, we called it a yazoo. It's a big mower, uh, like a mini bush hog on wheels, and uh, I was just going through the woods with it, and the, the dumb uh, spark plug cap kept popping off, and I was tired of like doing it because then you had to spend 20 years trying to get the thing to crank because this thing was built in like the 30s, um, and so... I decided about the fifth time that it did it, I'm just going to reach down there and I'm going to put the cap back on before the motor turns off. Okay, so if you're not the ones laughing, you don't understand. Let me tell you what happens. That was my first experience with the gift of tongues. You know what I know not to do now? Don't grab it and try to put it back on when the motor's running. Right? Right? It's funny, you couldn't let go of that thing either. It, it, just, it just kept on going, and I had shakes for like a year afterwards. And so some, Paul's saying you learn sometimes for experience. And, and he's saying, I've learned all this other stuff, man. I've got, I can quote Bible verses. There, there's some scholars that believe that Paul, being a young Pharisee, would have even been there in the trials of Jesus. And he says, I'm not even trying to throw up that stuff. All I want you to understand is you don't need all of this. You just need to understand the power of of the cross and of the resurrection. And so there's no, no need to divide. If we, like, you can, you can have your belief. There's some in here that have one belief on tongues. There's others that have a different belief on tongues. There's some people that believe this about the second coming. There's others that believe this about the second coming. As long as it's biblical and you're pursuing and the Holy Spirit's giving you that, that's fine. But here's the one thing we're going to stand our ground on and agree with, that Jesus was crucified and resurrected at the end of the day. That's it. That's where we stand. We have, we have liberty in some things, to believe, but when it comes to the essentials, this is what it is, and we're not going back from that, and Paul's telling them this, and he's trying to help them understand that he's going to give them this message of the cross, like you, you guys have taken the wisdom of everybody else, and I'm going to use quotations, the wisdom of everybody else, and you're missing it. You're running the church off of man-made wisdom and not on biblical wisdom, so when Paul says this, he says the message or the word of the cross. He's talking about the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. He, he's talking about a revelation from God. And I want you to notice there's three responses when you talk about the cross. Here's the first thing. Some people stumble over truth. They will say that there is no absolute truth. You have your truth. I have my truth. But if Jesus says he's the way and the truth, and we don't have him, then what we have is not the truth. And if your truth is not my truth, but my truth is not your truth, one of us is lying. Yeah, so there is absolute truth. Absolutely, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Absolutely. So there's none of this my truth, your truth, our truth, their truth. It's his truth. And Paul says in verse 22, For the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. The Jews didn't understand the cross, because they were looking through the wrong lens. They had their truth. And their truth didn't line up with that of God. And so they're, they, a lot of the Jewish people, the, the Jewish leaders, spend a good strong three and a half years trying to get rid of Jesus, doing everything they can to dismantle his teachings. They, they didn't like where he was going with his teachings because they felt like his teachings weren't lining up with their teachings because his truth wasn't their truth. So they're going to just try to destroy his truth. And in the end, which one's living? Jesus. It's his truth that goes on. We're not even talking about the beliefs of the Jewish people back then other than historical context. It's the same thing with the Roman government. Caesar, it's going to be my way, no way, you're going to worship me. 
I'm going to be a de deity. You're going to do the things that I tell you to do. You're going to be influenced by Rome. Now, are we still worshiping Caesar today? No, but we sure didn't name our pizza after him, right? <laughs> That's it. Jesus still stands. And so what they were looking for, the Jews were looking for the Messiah to rescue them from Rome. But the Messiah, if they would have studied the scripture just a little bit more, they would have realized that the Messiah wasn't come to rescue them from Rome. The Messiah was coming to rescue them from the bondage of sin. And sometimes we get that backwards. Look what it says in Isaiah 53. But he was pierced because of our what? Our rebellion. We're, we're rebels. We will rebel in a heartbeat. Crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. And we all went astray like sheep and we all turned to our own way and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of all of us. God took the punishment for us when we should have been the ones getting in trouble. You ever had that friend take the blame for you? I mean, I, I had a cousin, a second cousin, who went to prison, um, was charged with, with murder. And, um, and our family, even to this day, still believes that he took, he took the iniquity on himself because his brother was there and he did not want his brother going to jail. And it, it didn't make sense. And, and Jesus says, I know it doesn't make sense. This is why some people stumble over the truth. Because you know you, and then you see this Jesus guy, and knowing you and knowing him doesn't make sense why he would want to give his life for you. And then when you get written up and have to go to the principal's office, he intervenes and says, I'm going to take this one for you. Go back to class. And that's hard for us to fathom. Jesus came to be a servant, but also a sin bearer. You, you get that? Like he came to bear our sin. Because what sin did Jesus have? None. The Bible says he was a, a propitiation, that we averted the wrath of God because he took it on. Remember when it says at the crucifixion that the sky went dark? Some theologians believe that that was like God physically having to turn his back on his son, so Jesus would take on all of the wrath that came with that. And so I think for the Jews, just like us, sometimes we struggle and stumble over unbelief. And we'll do this with our prayers. We're, we'll pray for other people to be healed, but we won't pray for our own healing. Right? Because I believe that God could heal them. I just don't think God wants to heal me. I don't think God wants to answer. He, he'll do this to other people because I see people that pray and just, you know, they always seem to get the best parking spot at Target. It's like the favor of God is on them. And then I feel like I talk and God never, God never hears. For, for us, I think sometimes we just stumble over unbelief. We, we have this, when I see it, then I'll believe it mentality. But as followers of Jesus, we believe that believing is seeing. That we walk by faith and not by what? By sight. There's a faith that's involved here. If we didn't have to have faith, we would have no need to have to trust God because we would know everything. And I, and I know for us, we want to see the plan. I need to know 10 years down the road, where am I? I need to know in the middle of a diagnosis, where am I? And God says, we're going to walk by faith because it's truth. If you will just trust and spend time with me, you will trust that where we're going is going to be a good thing. But the Greeks had a different response from the Jews, where the Jews were like, listen, we stumble over the truth. We, we know there's a coming Messiah, but this isn't the Messiah. But the Greeks' response was different. Their, the message of the Greek was, it was just foolishness. This is, this is just dumb. And some laugh at the message of the cross. I mean, as a believer, you're, sometimes you'll face ridicule for the thing you, you believe. You believe that this guy died on a cross and rose from a grave? Yeah, I do. You, you believe that David took out this giant with a rock? Mm-hmm, absolutely. 
Let me blow your mind. I also believe that God spoke and everything came into existence. I don't care about your evolution. Uh, God spoke it and boom, it was done. I believe it. Let me tell you something else I believe. I believe he's coming back. So that sounds crazy to people. Hold on, you're telling me I need to surrender? I need, I need, I need, to, I need to surrender my whole life to him and just trust something that I can't see? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we put our trust in the government. I'm not being political, but we do, right? Well, okay, wrong crowd, wrong church. Good for y'all. Good for y'all. We pray for our government. We agree with that? Okay, good. I was going to say, we got to make sure if we're going to fringe on one side, we got to be on the other. All right. All right. It's getting too close to November. Let's move on to politics. All right, here we go. But some laugh at the foolishness of the cross. And it's like, I can't believe you believe that. I can't believe you do that. Hey, it's funny because sometimes you'll, you'll want to pray for somebody. And I, I felt this is weird, but this is the question that we kind of have to proceed with. Can I pray for you? Because some people don't want you praying for them. But if you don't believe in God, what do you worry about me praying for you? Right? There's a stark contrast between God's wisdom and man's wisdom. And when a man elevates his own wisdom, he automatically starts to lower God's wisdom. Because he thinks he's bigger. Hey, let me tell you about this little tower called Babel. Oh, we're, we're bigger than God. Look at us. Mm -hmm. Now you can't even understand what you're saying. And because of you, we now have to take all these classes and learn foreign languages instead of having one unified language. Thanks a lot. So he automatically lowers God's wisdom. And it looks like foolishness to him. I know. When we read stuff in the scriptures, sometimes I'm like, that's wild. I don't know. Like, I've got to get there. I'm going to have to trust that, God, yeah, God, I, I see it. I've got to get there to see it. Look what he says in verse 14. But the person, you ready? Without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit. Because it's foolishness to him, and he's not able to understand it since it's elevated spiritually. The, the man who's not a believer sees God's wisdom as foolish, but here, listen to me. Spiritual truth has to be spiritually discerned. And some people are trying to get past the belief that all these things in the Bible... Like, I, got, I, got, I don't know if I can believe all these things in the Bible. And this is their first step. But here's the thing. Belief doesn't start with, can I trust everything in the Scripture? Belief starts with, can I trust and believe that Jesus was who he said he was and can do the things that he said he can do? That's the starting point. Because let me tell you something. If you can believe that, if you can get there, if the Spirit reveals and enlightens you to that point, all this stuff makes sense. Like, yeah, because if, if I can believe that Jesus was crucified, even with historical evidence proving that, and that he rose from a grave and defeated death, then yeah, I believe that there was an ark that was being built out in the desert and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Absolutely. Because I believe that a God defeated death on his own. Everything else is easy to come by. Sometimes we spend way too much trying, time trying to convince unbelievers about passages and things in the scriptures to help get their unbelief to believe when we need to be pointing to Jesus, because that's where our faith starts. And when we start there, everything else comes to play. You, you follow what I'm saying? So, of course, it's gonna, I'm not bashing people that, like, I, this stuff seems silly. If you're here and you're like, this stuff seems like a joke and silly, you're in the right place. Let's walk it together and learn. You're okay. You're in good company. But we'll move through it. You'll get there. Because we're going to continue building our, our faith with Jesus. I'm thinking, I just think through, there's some people that you're, you trust your life with. You know what I mean? There's some people that you trust your social security number with. And there's some people, I'm not going to let them watch my cat. <laughs> right? But the more you're around people, you just didn't, you just didn't one day decide, you know, hey, Dylan, I'm, here's my credit card. You just hold on to it. You know, I trust it. You're not going to spend it. And here's my social security number. Now, why would I be willing to give Dylan my social security number? Well, I've known Dylan for a long time. So if you're first time today and we've never met, I love you. Sorry. Can't do it. I don't know you. We're not there. But the longer the relationship happens, the more the trust is there, the more the belief grows. You, 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 you smell what I'm stepping in. 
the more we do this, the more that we spend time with Jesus, the more we can trust. The more we can trust. This is why we're, again, I say it every week. I feel like I say it every single week. This is why we're going through the Bible so the Bible will get through you. Because the only way to interpret it is through his spirit. And what Paul's saying here, if a person does not have the spirit, they can't receive anything. They're not going to get it. It's not going to make sense to them. And I remember growing up in Sunday school, it did not make any sense to me. But one day the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. And I got a relationship with Jesus, and then everything else started making sense. Because you have the starting point. The spiritual truth has to be spiritually discerned. And a non-believer cannot, even with the understanding, even studying the scriptures and reading the scriptures, a non-believer cannot understand the truths of God without the Spirit of God. And these Greeks, and, and I'll just go ahead and throw this out to the Westerners, saw God's wisdom as absolute foolishness. Look at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. So where's the one who is wise? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the great debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom. God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is being preached. Paul goes on to say in verse 25 that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And he says that, in, 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 the, in the Old Testament, he says that his ways are higher than our ways, that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And look what he says in Romans 3. In Romans 3, God displays his wisdom. Um, he's showing his wisdom even at the cross of Jesus. For In Romans 3, 23, he says this, for all have done what? That's, that's all of us, right? Okay, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in the Aramaic, in the Spanish, in the Italian, whatever your language, it means all, every single one of us. For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. And God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would, uh, so that he would be just and justified the one who is, has faith in Jesus. Only God can do that. While Jesus was on the cross, he was taking the, our sin on him, the wrath of God on him, and at the same time justifying us. Only God can do that. Think about it. As Jesus is on that cross, and those Romans are crucifying him, he is giving them the very breath that they're breathing while forgiving them. Think about that. When Christ hung on the cross, he took on the full wrath of God for you and me. Like we don't have to take that on. And at the same time, he justifies the one who has faith. So only God could do that. We can't. Could you imagine... Us having to go and justify this, all of the sins that we've committed in our life to a holy God. Y'all want that job? Where do we start? Because we can't lie our way out of it. He knows all things. We can't convince him that we weren't there because he's everywhere. Do you understand now why it says that if you, the, the, the price of sin is death? Like if, if you want to pay for it on your own and do this your own way, that's fine. Here's the price. It's death. But if you'll allow Jesus to pay for what he's already paid for, then there's life. But you can't get that without him. Notice this last response. There's some people, some believe and experience God's power and wisdom. Some will look at it as truth, that they'll stumble over truths. Others will look at it as this is foolishness. It's just a joke. And for something that's a joke, it's amazing. The Bible continues to be a New York Times bestseller, isn't it? Every hotel, motel across the world has a copy of the Scripture. Next time you stay in one, if you want to have some fun, grab that Bible and just write, I love you, JC, and sign Jesus' name to every Bible, and people think they got a personal one. It'll be fun. 
Look what he says in verse 24. Yet those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul's making it clear. He, he's talking about the unbelieving Jews and Greeks. And when you and I believe, we begin to see the cross for what it is. Because at first glance, the cross appears to be cruel and painful and defeat. But having a relationship with Jesus, what the world meant the cross to be is not what Jesus meant the cross to be. you got to remember, that cross was a tree in the ground that only existed because God allowed that cross to exist in seed form to grow up to be the very thing that's going to be crucified in his son. you gotta, you got to remember that. And when you and I believe, we begin to see the cross for what it is. It's not about weakness. It's about power. It's not about defeat. It's about victory. It's the wisdom of God. And when we understand that as believers, there's a couple of walking points I want to give you this morning. We're going to start with this. Boast only in the cross. Not in our accolades and what we've accomplished. That's why Paul said, listen, I could come in here and just give you elegant speaking. He's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to preach the power of the cross and Christ crucified because that's what's important. People aren't looking to get in theological debates with you on Facebook. I know that's what it seems like they're doing, but that's not what they're doing. By the way, you'll never win that argument on Facebook. So don't even get into it. Just let it run. Just say, praying for you, JC. Just, you know. <laughs> what people are looking for and they may not even know they're looking for it, is the gospel. And some, sometimes it's, it's through the way we speak it. It's through the way that we act. Paul writes to the church in Galatians. But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross, and I've been crucified to the world. Look what he says in 1 John 1. In and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. That's a really fancy word there. Yes, and I had to Google it to figure out how to spell it. And trying to Google a word that I couldn't figure out how to spell was even more of a challenge. But that word propitiation literally just means that God took the, like we averted the wrath of God. Like it should have been us. And I don't know about you, but when I read the Old Testament and I see the wrath of God being poured out on the people in the Old Testament, I don't want that. I don't, I don't want that. I, I, want, I want to know the God who loves me, even though I don't understand why he loves me, because I know me, but he loves me anyway, and that's the one that I want to know. Because God loved me first. Think about that. We feel sometimes so unworthy and not loved and not cared for. And the Bible's saying he loved you before you did anything. You did not do anything to earn his love. Isn't that good news? That's why they call it good news. We didn't go looking for God. God came looking for us. And he gave himself for our sins. So Paul says, so we should only boast in the cross because the only reason we're still here, the only reason we still have breath is because the power of the cross, of Jesus working in us because he became a sin bearer for us. We averted the, the, the spiritual destruction and the wrath of God because of Jesus. And the Lord has laid on Jesus our sin, our iniquity, and Jesus, and Jesus alone took our place. That's the gospel. So last thing, last walking point. Understanding that, please don't be discouraged when people don't receive your message. Now, if they receive your message because you're being a jerk about it, then be discouraged that they didn't receive your message. But don't be discouraged when people don't receive your message. Keep on sharing the gospel. Jesus told his disciples that they were not responsible for how the message of the gospel received. They were only responsible for how the message, for getting the message out. We throw seeds. And not every time that you get in that, okay, all right, the waitress is coming. How can I make them feel uncomfortable? Hey, thank you for waiting on us today. If you walked out of here and got hit by a car today, where would you spend eternity? <laughs> Don't do that. They will spit in your food. But how about tip well, be kind, maybe pray for them, 
You don't have to make it a big spectacle. Hey, can we lay hands on you right here? Just, hey, we're about to pray for our food. Is there anything we can pray for? We have been called to share the gospel. The result's not up to us of what happens with that. We always view these spiritual conversations as a contractual contract. I'm going to share the gospel, you're going to say a prayer, and you're going to get saved right here, right now. And I'm not leaving this table until you do. I am convinced that the reason that back in the 90s, in the mid-90s, the reason that salvations were at an all-time high is because I was taught evangelism, and it was a hostage situation. I will let you go. When you tell me that you accept Jesus as your Savior, what are you going to do if you get hit by a bus? Can I tell you something that's going to free you? The result of whether or not they hear from the Spirit is not up to you. Because you can't give salvation. It's only the Holy Spirit. Now what you can be is the one that shares the message. Be in the Spirit. Be praying in Spirit. So the Holy Spirit does the work. We are not in the business of converting people. That is God's job. I love what Bill Bright said. He says, a successful witness is sharing Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and relieving those results up to God. And I know it's frustrating because there's people that you love and you really want to see them come to Christ. You really want to see them live out what John 10, 10 says, that, that, that full abundant life that he gives. And, and you pray and you're like, I just want them to pray it. They'll just pray it. But if they just pray a prayer off the fact just to get out of a conversation, was it real? Sometimes it can take years. Sometimes the person that's going to lead them to Christ is not you, but you may be the one planting the seed. We can't save anybody, but we, we can introduce them to the one who can. And that's what we do. So understand as we, we navigate our lives that there hasn't been a whole lot that has changed from Paul's day to our day. We still have to be careful as a church not to allow man's wisdom to seep in. That we hear from the Spirit. We have to not be so concerned and trip over and stumble over truths because it didn't play out the way that we thought. We have been called to be a Spirit-filled, Spirit-following, Spirit-guided church. Not a business. I'm not a CEO. I'm not a CFO. I am a pastor. We are followers of Jesus before anything else. And we have been called to proclaim a gospel to a world. It doesn't matter what the results are. But we meet people where they are, care for them where they are, and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work and stop trying to force it. And you're going to have to decide how comfortable you are and what level of sin you're comfortable with because as a church there are going to be people that are going to come through that door with a level 10 sin and the same Holy Spirit that's going to deal with that level 10 sin is the same one that already dealt with you with your level 10 sin or your level 1 or .5 wherever you think you are I want to pray for us and in our responding today we're going to sing and, and as we do have a little time of reflection. Um, but are there areas in your life where you're being tripped up on you just know your relationship with the Lord, just you, you haven't spent the time with them that you need to. And so you're you're throwing some truths and you're you're getting a little bit of your your beliefs from over here and a little bit from over here, but you're not getting them from here in the scriptures. Um, this is a time of confession for you. To just to confess to the Lord, like, hey, you already know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Probably hadn't heard my voice in a while. But it's just a time of surrendering back to, to being back in the Word. And maybe, maybe some of you, you're just hung up on the fact that this is just foolish. Everything I've said today, you just feel like it's foolish. That's okay. I'm not offended. But what I, what, here's what I want to tell you. If you feel that way and you feel something in your spirit right now that says, is unsettling, that's not anything that I said. I'm just the mailman. I delivered a package. That's the Holy Spirit. And, and you can't run from the Holy Spirit. God's going to chase you down and God's going to catch up with you. You weren't here today by accident. And we're not asking you to believe the whole scripture. What I am asking you is to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. 
and the very thing you've been asking, like you, you just feel like my life is in a wreck. I can't get through this. It seems like every time I turn, I just need help. I need hope. I need something. I'm just telling you what that something is. You can go get it in the world through a job, through drugs, through alcohol, through whatever it is. But I'm telling you what you need is right here, and it starts with Jesus, and he'll give you everything you ever asked for that aligns with his will. So I want to pray for you. Because if that's you this morning, it's time to surrender to the Lordship of who Jesus is. So let's pray. Father, as we come to this time, we're going we're gonna to reflect that this, this word that we preach can be foolishness to people. But God, when we, when we understand it through the cross, the lens of the cross, the cross is not what it appears to be. It's a power. It's a life on the other side because of what your son did. We, number one, God, we're, we're grateful this morning and thankful that you, you took on our sin. It should have been us paying the price. And even if we would have paid the price, it, we would have come up short, not had enough, and been turned away. But Jesus took on the full wrath, the full pavement of sin on our behalf. So Paul says that, that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we could become the righteousness of God, that we could have right standing with you. And so God, we thank you so much. For those here today who do not have a relationship with you, that maybe they've been stumbling in and saying, I, I don't know that I believe any of this stuff. I pray that 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 spirit that is bringing, working in them right now will continue to do a work and do what only he can do, which is to enlighten and to counsel and to bring them back into a relationship with you. So Jesus, I just thank you so much for today. May we stand, may we sing, may we go to the cross and confess, but may you be glorified no matter what it is we do today. And I pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus.